Pulp and root. Another important chapter. The pulp is the soft tissue of the tooth and you can feel it if you have a toothache. It is full of nerves, rich in blood vessels and lymphatic vessels and populated by many cells of the immune system. In addition, the shape of the root is very variable. This is because of its development. This lecture deals with the pulp and the root. We are dealing with both topics in one lecture because they are closely related in terms of their development and also anatomically. As topics, or if you will as learning objectives, we want to create an understanding of the shape of the root as it results as a consequence of tooth development. It's about the structure and about the biology of the pulp and of course we want to gain an understanding of the clinical significance that results from the position of the shape of the pulp cavity. There are a lot of good textbooks on this topic and ultimately you can find all the content I address in this lecture, of course all the pictures and words in my textbook Oral Structure and Biology, which is why I always include the page numbers in the top left hand corner. With the following radiograph, you will see it in a minute, I want to attract your attention to how important it is that you will have exact knowledge of the peculiar anatomical conditions of the root and the pulp. You must have it all the time in your inner eye. Well, actually, you cannot really see much when you have to perform an endodontic treatment if you ever have to perform them on one of your patients. The only thing peeking out of the rubber dam is the crown and you have to have a good idea of what's going on underneath in your inner eye as I said. Well I got this dental radiograph as a gift from a colleague and it shows some failed attempts. So you have to know the anatomical conditions well and it is indeed easy to be deceived. Whoever has done this treatment there, this unfortunate person could only look into the open pulp cavity from the occlusal side and if the file goes down so vertically into the depth then unfortunately aimed at the periodontal gap. And if you look at it from the top you will check what you have done you might see some blood at the bottom if there's any light at all coming in there. And it's nothing unusual because because the course of the pulp is well supplied by blood. And the moment you hit the alveolar bone, you can also feel it's a little bit harder. But you could erroneously assume, well, that canal is tight, or there might be a denticle or a pulp stone blocking the way of the instrument. You can think of all these things when you already notice that the instrument is not as deep inside as you measured in root length before. However, the fact that the instrument has long since left the center of the tooth and has been poking around in the periodontal space next to the tooth all the time can unfortunately only be seen on the control radiograph. Then it might be too late. If you have taken the wrong path, this is called via falsa. That's how you enter it in the patient's file. You know, the medical jargon is Latin. This sounds strange to some people, but you still have to explain the unfortunate patient exactly what happened anyway. You can then see a second attempt on the same radiograph here. If you now believe that the poor student doctor has now found the right canal, you are just as mistaken as the hopeless colic. Now the instrument runs exactly between the two roots. Of course, there is no pulp tissue there either, so this is also a false root. I have marked the correct root canal here in the picture with these white arrows. 
you can just about recognize it if you know where it runs. It is really quite narrow here because it is probably an older patient. And then, in the course of time, there has been a significant reduction in the volume of the pulp cavity because the dentine accumulates from the inside walls for life. This does not necessarily make root canal treatment any easier. And now it has become clear to everybody. We have to take a closer look at the anatomical conditions. And first of all, let's get an overview. The histological section on the left shows the crown, the root and the pulp. However, you can no longer see any of the enamel, which was dissolved by decalcification before the preparation was processed as a histological section. Enamel is so hard that it cannot be sectioned. That's why it's missing here. What you can see now here is the expansion of the dentine. Occlusally, it also shows a pattern similar to that of the tooth crown, which was the enamel coating. The section here shows the corresponding cusps in dentine. In canines, it would only be one tip, and in incisors, an, inc an incisal edge. The space in which the pulp tissue is located is called the pulp chamber or the pulp cavity. And as just mentioned, the pattern of the crown is also reflected sort of by the pulp. In this sense, what corresponds to the cusps is called pulp horn. And all teeth therefore have a pulp roof, which is formed by the dentin that lies over the pulp. And multi-rooted teeth also have a pulp cavity floor, which is formed by the interradicular dentine. A distinction is then made between a crown pulp, where the cusps are also visible, and a root pulp in the pulp cavity. The histological section also shows the pulp tissue itself, a loose, specialized connective tissue. This means many cells and an intercellular ground substance, which is, with its fiber network, provides a structure and support for the many cells, the nerves, the blood and lymphatic vessels. In general, the root canals, which may also be called the root pulp, they follow the shape of the tooth roots. However, there are also many individual variations in the course and number of canals within the roots. At the tip of the root, the vascular nerve bundle extends into the pulp at the apical foramen. And one more thing about the apical foramen. In many cases, we do not only find just one opening. There can be several additional foramina at the root apex, and there are also even more additional foramina further to the side of the root. In the finished tooth, the diameter of the apical foramen is about 0.3 or 0.4 millimeters. And as long as the root apex is not yet fully formed, the foramen is still significantly wide open. You need to know all this if you want to carry out a root canal treatment. I need to say something about the structure of the pulp tissue. The distribution of the cells and the shape of the cells is not the same in all places. In the crown pulp, the uh, section marked here with the letter B, you can see how the odonoblasts, labeled OD, are slender, columnar and close together. The odonoblasts are the cells that form the dentine and therefore they are also the outermost cell layer of the pulp. In the area of the root pulp, in section C, they are also closely together, but they have a more cubic shape, and in the area of the root tip, at D, they are quite flat. We will talk about the other tissue layers in the pulp a little later. Let us first talk about the development of the root. This will make a large part of the anatomy easier to understand. From the lecture on tooth development, we already have a certain idea of how the root forms. The pulp develops from the dental papilla and is therefore of ectomesenchymal origin. And at the time when the first formation of the hard substance begins in the bell stage of the tooth formation, 
a structural pattern of the connective tissue in the dental papilla can already be recognized. The peripheral cells of the dental papilla differentiate into odonoblasts, which will form dentin. And blood vessels and nerves are also already clearly visible. In the image here, we first discuss how the root is formed in the first place, and afterwards we talk about the blood vessels and nerves, which are already clearly visible here. So how does the root get its shape? When the enamel has finished forming, the epithelial cells of the tooth bell are still needed. The cells of the outer enamel epithelium come together with those of the inner enamel epithelium. In this way they form Hertwig's epithelial sheath, or the cervical loop. This is a kind of an epithelial ring that serves as a template for the attachment of the odonoblast for the deposition of the dentine. Without this epithelial template, they would have no attachment surface and would not have predetermined shape for the root. Hertwig's epithelial sheath is so called because the anatomist Oskar Hertwig was the first to describe it. It runs apically and the odonoblast deposits dentine from the inside onto it and thus creating the root. Details about the structure of dentine are discussed in the dentine chapter and how the root is attached to the bone is discussed in the periodontal and desmodontal chapters. Another exciting question is how multi-rooted teeth come about. So what I have just explained applies to single-rooted teeth and was still quite easy to understand. But there are also two, three or multi-rooted teeth. We observe that two or three such epithelial tongues form at the edge of the tooth bell. They get longer and longer and meet in the middle like a gusset in pants. And yes, as soon as they, as they have met in the middle, a new ring-shaped circular head with sh epithelial sheaths have formed again, and these then will give rise to each individual root. And this works in the same way as it does with single rooted teeth. But I don't know why these tongues, which are the prerequisite for the formation of multi rooted teeth, grow out just there, in certain regions of the cervical loop. Earlier I said that the arteries, the veins and the lymphatic vessels and the nerves enter and exit the pulp at the apical foramen. However, there are also a large number of additional canals, which are called the accessory canals. Here in the picture we have shown an example of one of these canals with its contents. Blood vessels and nerves run from the pulp to the periodontal space and back. So there is a connection between the pulp and the periodontal space. And there is not just one only of these small canals, but there are about a thousands of them or even more. And this has a clinical significance. If there is a pulpitis, the cytokines specific for inflammation, I mean the messenger substances that tell the cells involved that there is an inflammation here going on, can migrate into the neighboring tissue and tell them that there is a proper information going on just where they come from. In other words, what you know, the metabolic rate increases, the blood flow increases and the blood vessels are swelling and that way they are pressing on the surrounding nerves and then you can feel it as a pulsating pain. And because of these Many lateral canals which connect the pulp with the periodontal space, a pulpitis, can also spread as a local information of the periodontal space. And conversely, anyone who has ever undergone orthodontic treatment can probably also say that it was not only the periodontal space that may sometimes hurt, but also the whole tooth. And now this type of pain is limited. But you know now the context, how it is. And why do we have so many lateral canals? How do these many lateral tubules come about? And once again, a knowledge of the developmental processes helps us here. Before the root is even formed, 
the area of the later crown pulp is already quite well supplied with vessels and nerves. In the pictures here, I have only shown the arteries in red for the sake of clarity. These vessels already run as a finely branched network between the later pulp tissue and the tooth follicle. This is not shown here either, but you already know where it is. All around the dental primordium, which later will become the periodontal tissue, that's the dental follicle. And when the root is formed, as can be seen in the pictures B and C, the blood vessels are not displaced at all, but the dentine is deposited around the vessels and around the nerves and thus creating these canals. This is similar to how the dentine tubules are formed when the dentine is deposited around the odonoblast processes. So in the finished tooth at D, we then have these many lateral canals of which I have only drawn four here again for the sake of clarity. But I can show you some impressive images from the scanning electron microscope here. Here you can see a molar with its root seen from the apical side. The apical foramen, I mean many of those foramen at the root tips are immediately noticeable. If uh, you look even longer, you will see more and more and the many accessory canals. It's a bit like spending a starry night on a rowing boat on a lake and having enough time to look at the sky full of stars in tranquility. The longer you look, the more stars you will see. And here you can see another perhaps better proof than that of my schematic drawings from just before. This impressive preparation can be seen in Bernd Tillmann's atlas. It shows how the blood vessels run not only apically, but also laterally into the roots. And this is where the many lateral canals are located. This is not only fascinating, but it also has a clinical significance. Root canal treatment always raises the question of whether it is successful in the long term. This depends, among other things, on how high the infection load in these lateral canals may be. You always have to keep that in mind. It is always helpful to know the developmental processes, as can be seen also from the question of why some root tips are bent distally. We know that the teeth emerge with their crowns into the oral cavity when the last third of the root is not yet fully formed. We also know that the teeth still move slightly mesially, and this is slightly different for each tooth. In most cases, the incisors initially erupt into the oral cavity with some spaces, and only when the canines erupt, these canines with their voluminous crowns will push together the teeth so that there are no more spaces in between. And in the meantime, the root tips have formed, and because they have migrated in mesial direction at the same time, the traction of the vascular nerve bundle at the apical foramen has ensured that the root tip points distally. The extent of this bending depends on the amount of migration of the tooth. The distal bending of the root can be seen very clearly in the lower first permanent molars. As they erupt, they clearly migrate mesially because the second deciduous molar in front has a much larger crown extension than the following bicuspid. And the permanent molar then moves about 2 mm mesially, which naturally has an effect on the distal bending of its root apex. The variability of root canals is enormous. This has been described by many authors using histology, radiography, computer tomography and magnetic resonance imaging and 3D reconstructions. However, there is a correlation between the external shape and the internal structure. For example, roots with uh, a round cross-section usually have only one root canal while roots with an elliptical or flat cross-section often have more than one root canal. In such cases, it can happen that two closely adjacent canals run together for some stretches 
and are only separated in some regions by a thin wall made of dentine. Incisors, canines and the second bicuspids in the upper jaw usually have only one root canal. However, this is not always the case. Two root canals are described for the lateral and central incisors of the lower jaw in 20 to 45 percent of the cases and depending on the literature source. And even the lower canines do not always have only one root canal but in 13 to 18 percent, depends on where you read it, of the teeth examined there, it may be two canals. And examples can be seen in the models here in the picture, but of course you do not yet know how many root canals you can expect to find in your individual patient. For this you need to have an individual diagnostics and the patient you want to avoid an artificial opening of the pulp, as can be seen here in the small picture. The pulp horn can come quite close to the proximal box that has been prepared here. And modern minimally invasive preparation techniques should prevent this as far as possible. But if you have deep softened dentine, well, not, I'm not enough of, this, of an expert for this, you will learn that from your dental colleagues in the operative dentistry. And on the right in the picture, not so pleasant, you can see a patient with an extensive trauma-related loss of the dental crowns, which for once gives you an insight into the cross-section of the root canal in vivo. So, transversely oval in the central incisor, round in the second incisor, and vestibular orally oval in the canine, and similar but clearer in the first bicuspid. The dental models here from the teaching collection of the Anatomical Institute of the University of Greifswald show once again in 3D the relationship between the shape of the tooth crown and the pulp cavity in the tooth. And in the bite wing radiograph you can only see this in a two-dimensional projection. But you have to have a certain 3D image in your head. And the pulp cavity becomes smaller during the course of life. This is completely normal due to the continuous formation of dentine which does not stop throughout life and it may also be triggered by caries when dentine formation may be accelerated and the pulp retracts. This phenomenon can also be observed in this molar. The distal pulp horn has clearly retracted under the filling due to the formation of the tertiary or reparative dentine. I wouldn't really be satisfied with such a two-dimensional image. That is why I find such research approaches which show the pulp in its real spatial extension very promising. Here you can see a selection of images by Professor Michael Baumann's habilitation thesis. These are in vitro magnetic resonance tomographies dating back to 1992 and I hope that technical developments will progress to such an extent that you will one day be able to use them as a normal routine diagnostics in your practice. I think it would be better if you knew exactly what to expect in your patient before starting treatment. The variability of the root canals and lateral canals is incredibly large. Take a look at the preparations with the ink injections and the schematic illustrations here. There is so much more to say about the pulp, so here we can go into more detail about the tissue zones. We already addressed this in the initial overview at the beginning of the lecture, but now you can take a closer look at the tissue layers. The odonoblasts from the outermost layer of the pulp, and we have already shown that the beginning, uh, that uh, depending on the region, they can look slender in the crown, cubic in the middle of the root and rather flat towards the root tip. And below this is a lighter looking layer which looks so light because there are fewer cells here, especially fewer cell nuclei visible under the microscope. It was described by the Munich court dentist Weil in the century before the last and it's therefore known as the Weil zone with few nuclei. It is not always so clearly visible. 
In the early stage of dentine formation, it is often not so visible and it is often even missing in the middle and the apical region, but in the crown pulp, there it is particularly recognizable. However, the cell-free vials zone is not empty at all. Many fibroblast processes which come from the underlying bipolar zone extend into this zone and many blood vessels also run here. Some vascular loops even reach the odonoblasts. Under the vial zone, there is another now darker cell rich zone. Here, the cells lie closely together with a flattened nucleus. These cells are elongated, slender, and therefore give the impression of being bipolar. In the coronal part of the pulp, these cells lie parallel to the dentine wall, but they can also lie in another direction. And below this is a layer in which the nerves are tightly interwoven which is described as Rashkov's nerve plexus. Isaac Rashkov described it in his dissertation thesis in 1835. And from here, individual nerve fibers extend to the odonoblast, while others extend even into the dentinal tubules together with the odonoblast processes, and many of them right up to the dentino enamel junction. And now it becomes clear why teeth can hurt so much. And beneath Rashkov's nerve plexus, we find a layer that is rich in blood vessels. The structure of the layers can already be seen in the histological image, which is, of course, best illustrated by the diagram at B in the middle. And also in the scanning electron microscopical image on the far right, we see the odonoblast, Weil's zone, and the blood vessels. Overall, the pulp is intensively supplied with blood vessels. On one hand, the main vessels enter and exit the pulp through the apical foramina. But blood vessels also run through the many accessory canals, which I explained in detail earlier. In fact, these lateral vessels contribute more to the pulp's blood supply than the apical vessels. The pulp is also in close contact with the vascular system of the periodontium via these numerous blood vessels in the lateral canals, but I've already said that. And at the periphery of the root and crown pulp, the blood vessels form a very dense capillary plexus, the peripheral branches of which form loops that reach as far as the odonoblasts do. And many of the arteriovenous anastomoses with different diameters are also found here. And we must not forget the lymphatic vessels, and also run here branching out finely into the periphery. The dense vascular network of the pulp has many arterioles with pronounced musculature in the vessel walls, which makes it possible to adapt the blood flow in the pulp regionally into the metabolic requirements. This means that inflammation can be localized without affecting the entire pulp. Many people associate toothache with the pulp, and that's obvious, as it is also intensively supplied with all kinds of nerves. And yes, it is one of the most densely innervated tissues in the human body. Unlike the blood vessels, the nerves run through the apical foramen and through the many accessory canals. And depending on the axon's diameter, myelinization and conduction modality there are six morphologically distinguishable types of nerve fibers. There are the non-myelinated nerve fibers, which belong to the autonomic nervous system. Most of them run along with the blood vessels and innervate their muscles, thus regulating the degree of vasoconstriction. Medullary, which is myelinated, medullary nerve fibers belong to the trigeminal nerve. These are somatosensitive afferent nerve fibers that have free nerve endings and convey diffuse but intense pain. The signals in the nerves are transmitted in the form, in form of electrical action potentials. This happens quite quickly in the A-beta fibers at 30 to 70 meters per second, and this is sort of actually immediately. And then, according to a speed, a distinction is made between fast and slow A-delta fibers, and the C fibers are slow, 0.5 to 2.5 meters per second. In addition, 
neuropeptides are transported by the nerves from the pulp in the axons and by the neurons in the trigeminal ganglion and back to the pulp. And this transport can take days and weeks. Another clinical note on pain conduction then. The different cores of toothache after caries and after dental procedures like fillings, grinding of crowns and orthodontic tooth movements, as well as the variable course of information of the pulp over days and weeks becomes comprehensible. If the chemical reactions of the nerve permeable neuropeptides are taken into account in addition to the fast running action potentials of the nerve. The diverse reactions of the pulp cells during inflammation and repair are also controlled in interaction with the neuropeptides released by the nerve endings. And in cases where pain or inflammation is caused by a single tooth, the neighboring teeth or even more peripheral areas can also cause the patient considerable discomfort. This makes it difficult to find the guilty tooth. It stands to reason that this spread of pain is related to the fact that the neuropeptides not only follow the same route they came from the neuron back to the pulp, but they can also follow the nerve branches into neighboring teeth and neighboring regions. In the course of lifelong dentine formation, dentine is not always deposited layer by layer on the inner walls of the pulp. Instead, bizarre deposits of dentine can form, which are localized accumulations or roundish formations. And these are referred to as denticles or pulp stones. Only those that also show a tubular dentine structure are referred to as true denticles. Calcium deposits that have a concentric layered structure with the typical lines but no dentinal tubules are referred to as false denticles. These denticles can lie freely in the pulp tissue or protrude from the dentin wall into the pulp. So now we come to the take home message. We have seen that the outline of the crown pulp basically reflects the shape of the crown but continues to change in the course of further dentine formation. In addition, a practical distinction is made between a crown pulp and a root pulp. And the pulp tissue varies depending on the location and on the layering underneath the surrounding dentine. The pulp is the tissue that is most densely innervated and is supplied with nerve conduction at different speeds. And important for me, are the many lateral canals which, in addition to the apical foramen, create a connection between the pulp and the periodontal space. And with this, I thank you for your kind attention to this lecture on the root and on the pulp.